why now? Why the decision to speak now after all this time has passed? Where's your head at? Um, well, I, I think part of it is I finally got the approval of my attorneys to do so. They, um, the ones working on the defamation cases, they said um, it's easier to win a defamation case the more the people talk. And so they've been collecting uh, a lot of evidence over the past uh, while. And, um, and also I think that uh, now that some of the emotion has died down in the world and with, with people that are led by their feelings, I think now um, they deserve to hear um, some logic and some truth and, um, and make their own assessment. So. Do you miss her? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Did you feel, did you see this coming? Yes, but it doesn't change at all the, the power of the pain of reality. I, I saw it coming for years. I told them for years this would happen over and over. I said, if she gets off her medicine, uh, suicide is, is the next thing. You know, she, she tried it in the past, but with me, uh, she always remained okay with me. She was on her meds with me. She was healthy and happy. And even if she did get low or stopped taking her medicine, I would help her get back on it, and things would be fine without me and with her family. Uh, she's off meds, and she committed suicide. And, and, and I told them this would happen over and over again. Um, I tried my best to stop her from getting a gun. I went to judges. I have, I have copies of all the, the police. I talked to her counselor, the pastor she was going to, um, her family, her friends. I told them all, don't let her get a gun. Do whatever it takes. Prevent her from getting a gun. And, um, and when she was with me, she was never able to um, go that far. Uh, but with them, that's, that's exactly what happened. And it, and it uh, destroyed me. And uh, I still, honestly, I still haven't really grasped it. Like, it hasn't. I kind of keep putting off the reality of it, and um, I try not to think about it as much as I can. What was going on in your marriage the week Micah died? The week she died, we didn't talk that entire week. I'd emailed her several times that week, and my regular emails are sending her letters telling her that I love her. And um, she, she came over to the house. The last time I saw her was uh, a few weeks before she passed away. We spent about four hours together. And uh, we hugged and kissed, and she was in and out of psychotic um, conversations. She would say, you know, one thing about double agents that are following her. That was one of the phrases she would use when she was off her meds, double agents. The other phrase she would say, she wants to come home so bad, but her family won't let her. Um, she told me she wanted to live in Africa and asked me if I'd live with her. I said, sure, if you take your medicine, you know. Um, and so um, she told me, uh, if I'd give her some money and if I would uh, write her um, a letter saying certain things in this letter that she would take her medicine. And so I tried that, and, um, but she desperately wanted to come home. She was just so afraid her family would disown her. And so the week before she passed away, um, I probably emailed her maybe seven or eight times that week just saying, I love you. You need your lithium. You know, don't forget who you are when you're on medicine versus who you are when you're off. She had lost 40 pounds in a month and nobody it was in her life thought to take care of her. Nobody. She was living with a, a former registered nurse. Her family, quote unquote, were taking care of her. She lost 40 pounds in one month and no one thought she needed help. She was talking about living in Africa. No one thought she needed help. She's making videos on Facebook. And if you see the videos, you know it's not her because she has a different cadence, a different tone, a different amount of words per minute when she's healthy uh, and on medicine than when she's off. And the way she was even looking into space when she's taking those videos, you knew she was delusional. And if somebody loved her enough to take her to a professional and say, okay, this woman says she's being abused or this woman says, you know, this or she's lost 40 pounds in a month. If someone thought I need to take her to a professional, that professional would have known that she needed medicine. And uh, the reason I know that's true is because I took her a few months before, she, uh, a few weeks before she passed away, I took her to probate court. And in three minutes time, three minutes time, she went in, she walked back out. When I went in, they said, your wife is uh, mentally ill and she needs medicine desperately. And I said, okay, let's, let's, let's do it. Let's get her the medicine. Let's get her help. And they said, she's not a danger to anybody in society, so we can't force her to do it. But if one of her family members or friends had taken note of the way she was acting and seen what was happening to her physically and taken her to just one professional, they could have saved her life. Where were you when Micah died? I was, it was on a Saturday. I was in Charleston with about 100 people from my kids' school. What, what, what was it? Oh, soccer. It was a soccer tournament. Okay, so we know, you know, I've, I've gone through Micah's last day uh, pretty much almost down to the minute. Um, 
what bring us through your last day. Uh, you said soccer. Were there any? Do you have any documentation that they were there? Oh, you're you're, oh, you're asking because you, okay, I got you. <laughs> yeah, of course. Yeah, I can't believe people. Oh my lord. So yeah, I was with about a hundred people. We had dinner that night. We were all together at the soccer fields that day. Um, afterwards, um, after the soccer game, I was somebody was with me the entire time. Um, who I can't name due to legal purposes, but I will say it's somebody that I love more than anything else on planet Earth. Man or woman? Um, young person that I cannot name due to legal purposes, um, but somebody that I am responsible for and love very, very much. And that person was with me, and we went shopping in Charleston, and we got food in Charleston, and um, there's all the receipts from that throughout the time. We got, I think we might have gotten gas too, and then I uh, made it back to. Um, and made it back to Myrtle Beach. And I even, I was just actually looking today at emails that I sent her that day. I sent her four emails that day. And um, I just noticed today that two of those, um, she wasn't able to read because it was after it had happened. What do you think happened that day? So according to what she's tried to do in the past, and according to her doctors who have taken care of her for years, and according to me who's seen it over and over again, um, I imagine that she was in an incredibly euphoric attitude I saw her pictures on the Dick's Pawn Shop. Someone sent me screenshots of the Dick's Pawn Shop pictures where she's smiling, which out of the six or seven times that she tried to commit suicide in the past, only one of those times was she depressed. The other times, she was very euphoric. And she would wake up and say, I think I'm supposed to die today. And I said, no, 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 honey, you're not, you're not gonna do that. She said, well, my mind tells me that I'm supposed to kill myself. I said, we're not gonna listen to your mind. We're gonna take you to a doctor and get you help. And I discovered, of course, that she had stopped taking her meds each time. But <clears throat> either way, she was in a euphoric attitude. And so you see the Dick's Pawn Shop video where she's wearing her, um, her work clothes and um, with a smile on her face. So they sold her a weapon. And then um, I assumed that she drove. She told one of her best friends. So far, her four, the four people she spent the most time with every week, no one's interviewed or talked to those four people. And one of those people that I talked to told me that she told her two years ago, if I ever commit suicide, I'm going to go to this place in Lumberton, the state park or something like that. Which so, friend is that? Um, I probably wouldn't want to name her because I saw this friend uh, one time here in public for 30 seconds. And of course, Robbie S. Harvey, as usual, got somebody to take a picture and destroyed the girl's life, brought up her past and horrible things about her. So people are scared to tell the truth or to talk about the good things of Micah because of the social media. So um, this moms. friend says that Micah told her if I'm going to take my life, I will probably do it in Lumberton River State Park. She told me that after Micah passed away, but she told me that Micah told her that two years ago. Yeah. Did she say why? Why that location? She said because Micah told her it was peaceful and outdoors. And Micah did love the outdoors, loved the outdoors. Vacations were outdoory vacations because that's what she loved. But so Has she ever been there? No, not that I know of. Not ever that I know of. Do you guys have any connection to that area? Not at all. I never have even you ever been there? It. Nope. I've never even heard of the place. I've never even heard of, what was the city? Robinson County. I've never even heard of there before. So did it strike you as, before you heard this, did it strike you as odd when you heard that she, where she went and what they say allegedly happened? Did you question it at all? Well, I didn't think it was real. I thought her family had made it up and had somebody call me and say that. So that's one big thing. I didn't think it was real. When I found out it was real, you know how like, um, you know like you tell somebody something, you tell them, you tell them, you tell them, you tell them. And then when it happens, you don't want to say, I told you so, because it's a horrible thing. That's what I felt like. I felt like, I told y'all, like I told her family this so many times you can't imagine. I told her friends this. I told everybody. I said, if y'all don't get her her lithium, she's going to commit suicide. Her doctor told her this on paperwork where her doctor said this. And, and then when I get the call, I felt, I just, I felt like, I felt like the world's biggest failure because I spent the past three months when she, when her family got her out of the hospital and didn't bring her home and her dad talked her into buying him a car and all this stuff was happening that was all crazy. 
I made a vow that I was going to do something every single day to try to get her back on her lithium and save her life. And so every day I did something. Sometimes I did four, five, six, seven things. Some days it's just one thing. But every day, whether it was an email, a text, visit someone, talk to a family member, talk to a friend, go somewhere, go to a judge, go to probate, I'm going to do something to save her life. And I spent every single day for those three months doing that. So getting that phone call <clears throat> made me feel like the world's uh, greatest failure. I was, the, I, I was against the whole world because everyone told me that it wasn't true and that, 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 that um, I was making it up and that whatever they were saying. So it was me against the world for three months and I failed. What was the call and who, who was the call from and what did oh, they say? Man, that's, it was a man. I got a call and it was, um, I think, I think it was a detective, I think. Mm -hmm. And he, I remember him being very calm and very nonchalant. And so that's why I thought, well, this is not real. And so I started screaming. I had a family member that was there with me. I started screaming for them to use their phone to call the hospital where the guy said she was at. And um, my family member called the hospital and said it was real. And I still didn't believe it. And so I called a, um, a police chief that I know somewhere around here, a captain or somebody. And I said, um, there's a detective named such and such on the phone telling me these things. Like, is this real? Is, it, is this a real person or not? And that person told me that it was real as well. And I just remember, I remember screaming really loud and throwing up everywhere. And, um, what did they tell you? Um, I remember throwing up. Did I have spaghetti that day? It was a lot of throw up. It was something red. I'm sorry? What did they tell you? Um, I don't remember that. Oh, no, I don't remember that. Hold on. I don't remember. He said, he remember called the hospital and spoke to, I think, either the head nurse or medical examiner or somebody. And that lady read me stuff that the Robinson County, I guess, had wrote on a piece of paper. And she was reading me suicide and the weapon and the where it was at and uh, all these different facts. And so then I, because the detective would not tell me it was suicide. And then I called him back and told him what the hospital told me. And he was pissed off and asked me who that lady's name was. And I didn't know her name. And if I didn't know, I wasn't going to tell him anyway, because I'm glad she told me anyway. And so, um, and I said, is this stuff true? And I can't remember if he said yes or just hung up. I don't remember. I don't remember. Do you remember what he said, though? No, oh, man. I don't... I don't remember at all. If I try to, if I try to, if I try to enunciate it, I'll probably be making something up based on all the crashing of everything going on. So I don't, I can't tell you for sure. Did you ever question the findings that the authorities gave to you that this was suicide? No, I mean, I'm not a detective. I, I, you know, I watched Scooby-Doo growing up, but that's what everybody seems to be acting like is they're, you know, part of the mystery machine. But my Lord, like, let my wife, let her, let her, let her be at peace. Like, she's in heaven. She, she's not worrying about all this stuff. Let her, let her rest. Let her memory rest. She had suicidal um, tendencies over and over, year after year, off medication especially. She went to Dick's Pawn Shop before, purchased a weapon, and tried to do the same thing. Uh, she drove out in the middle of nowhere. She called 911, left a voice message. I, I don't really understand what else could be. But you know what? I'm not a professional, so I don't know. In other words, it all added up to you. It made sense to you. I mean, I'm not a detective. Um, if, if she had heart surgery, I'm not going to question the heart surgeon. I just, I don't know anything about detective work at all. Right, but it's your wife. I mean, it's, and them telling you her, her life has ended. Are you trying to ask me if I think somebody murdered her? Do you think anybody murdered her? No. One of the things that raised eyebrows initially for the public was when you gave a sermon here and you announced publicly uh, that she had committed suicide. Uh, and you talked about, you attributed it to her mental health. Why did you feel the need to come out with that at that moment? That's a great question. So 
Well, first, let's discuss why I preached that morning. Is that okay? Okay, so people have been asking that. So, have you, have you ever taken any psychology classes or anything like that? Very few. Okay, yeah, I haven't taken any. So, I, I would love to find a book or a psychology professor or someone that could tell me the correct response when you spend seven years trying to keep someone alive by just taking a few pills that their family tells them not to take. Then when they don't take it, they go into a hospital, their family takes them out, and then you spend three months trying to get them help when her family's telling them that you're evil and the bad person. And then it finally happens, the thing that you've been dreading for seven years, then you're trying to prevent for seven years, then it happens. I don't know what the correct response is, right? Am I supposed to stay home and cry? Am I supposed to go out with my friends? Am I supposed to go to a bar and drink? I don't know what the right thing is. Right, as a pastor, should I just get on my knees and pray? I mean, I wanna die in that moment. And so the next morning, I remember thinking, okay, if I stay home, I'm probably gonna kill myself. I'm probably gonna just go to heaven and be with her and be done because I need to be around people, but I don't wanna be around people and come to church and I'm not gonna preach because then I'll be judging the guy that's preaching the whole time and I can preach just as easy as I can breathe. So I'm just gonna go in the mode of what I'm normally gonna do and just continue my life normally until I finally have to deal with what's going on. And so I didn't know what else to do. I didn't know the right response. I wish somebody had told me if I, in hindsight, uh, if I go back in time, I probably would have done the same thing and still preached. And then at the end, and the sermon was about leaving your legacy and, and the people you leave on earth and, and, and your memory that's being left. So I thought maybe that's God. Then I thought, you know what? Micah would want me to preach. That's exactly what she'd want me to do. She'd be telling me to do it. She'd be trying to force me to do it. So I preached. And then at the end of the sermon, when I made the announcement, the announcement was made, and of course, I'm not in a clear thinking frame of mind. I mean, it's like, you know, it's not like I'm, you know, kumbaya and got it all together. Um, I, I said what I said because I didn't want them to think that it was because she's a bad person, or I wanted them to know, like, what, what, if Micah does anything that's out of character, it's because of her mental illness, it's not because of her. Like she's a wonderful woman, full of integrity. When she's on her medicine, she, she's black and white, does the right thing, does not like the wrong thing being done. Off medication, she's a totally different person, and I didn't want them to see her as um, someone that was bad. I wanted them to know it's just a sickness, like if you have heart disease or if you have you know, diabetes or whatever, mental illness, you need med medicine to continue going forward. And So um, that's why I said that. Also something I found interesting, in that moment, you said, before I tell you this news, I'm going to paraphrase here. I'm going to tell you this news, and I don't want you, I want you to leave. I don't want you to stand up and talk about it. Why? That's a great question, and that was actually intentional because the last thing I wanted to hear was people talking about my wife. I wanted them to go home and take it to Jesus before they start, you know, doing what some Christians like to do and just chatter, 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 and I didn't want to experience the extra pain. I didn't want to be mad at somebody in my church because I heard them say, well, you know, I'm not even going to guess at what somebody could have said, but I didn't want anybody to say anything negative about my wife. Another cons point of concern, let's say, for people watching was you, when you, you gave a eulogy. It was something concerning. People said that was concerning that you said that you tried to raise Micah from the dead. And I believe at another point you said you laid next to her body in the morgue. Is that true? I didn't lay next to her body. I mean, I laid, I, I, I couldn't, you can't lay next to her because she's, this, her body's up on this thing, but I mean, I hugged her and um, I sat on the floor, you know, next to her and just talked to her for a while. Um, but yeah, I tried raising her from the dead because you know what? If it had worked, we'd have a whole different story, but God forbid me not try it and always wanted the rest of my life, would it have worked? Right? Jesus did it, Elisha did it, it's a few other people in the Bible and so on. Um, Yes, if, if somebody I love more than anything in the world has passed away what I believe to be an early death, you better believe I'm going to try to, in Jesus' name, raise them from the dead. I believe in healing. I believe in miracles. I believe in the raising of the dead. I'm a one God, apostolic, tongue-talking, holy, rolling, born again, heaven-bound believer in the liberated power of Jesus' name. I'm not ashamed of it. Would you characterize your relationship with Micah as healthy? <laughs> Oh man, we had, when she was on her medicine, we had the greatest marriage you could ever imagine. We spent every day together. I don't know any other couple that spent every day. So we wake up, well, she'd kind of wake up before me, but you know, we'd go, to, we'd go work out together every day, five days a week. We'd eat lunch together every day. We would work together every day. We'd pick up the kids, just over the kids every day. We'd go to dinner every night together. Then every night, we would have our routine. So there's three things we would do. We would either sit in the bathtub together for two hours until the water went from steaming hot to ice cold. 
she bought this um, big air mattress we'd put in the back of the truck and we'd go park somewhere here in Myrtle Beach where there's no lights and we'd, she'd bring us some hot chocolate and we'd lay on the air mattress for two hours or we would go out on the beach with our beach blanket and lay there for two hours. But the point was no cell phones, just her and I. She would talk 90% of the time, I would talk 10% of the time and I would just listen. And so every night, two hours, we'd hang out together. And so was our marriage healthy? It's probably as healthy as any other American marriage. Have you ever abused your wife? Never, not once in any way, shape, or form. I took better care of her than anybody could ever take care of her. Um, I never made her, asked her to clean the house, not once in seven years of marriage. She never had to cook a single meal. She never had to work. She was never harmed physically in any way. In a letter, or in an email you wrote to Micah, you apologized, yes. right? You apologized for hiring, for tracking her, for uh, messing with her tires, for posting the picture. Um, so that's all true, right? So if I, I wanted, if I, great question, I'm so glad you asked that actually. If I wanted to lie about that, I would just say I never wrote the letter, right? Because how can you prove that I wrote somebody a letter? There's no signature, there's no name, it's not in my handwriting. But I 100% wrote the letter. And I did it because the night that she was with me, the last night we were together for four hours, at one point, because the whole four hours I'm trying to get her to take her medicine. And then she's saying, my family doesn't want me to, they don't want me to come inside the house. Said, Maybe it's your house, come inside. So if I finally get to the point, she says, you know what, um, I'll take my medicine and I'll come home if you'll give me $10,000 and if you'll um, write me an apology letter. So let me understand this correctly. The letter, that, the email that you wrote to Micah, apologizing for uh, hiring a PI, tracking her, uh, messing with her tires, uh, and posting a, a topless photo of her. You wrote that, you say. Yes, but sir. But now you're saying that you di didn't actually do these things. I did the PI thing, um, but so over the years what I, I've learned with her is when she's in a delusional st state of mind, I have to play into it in order to get her to get her back on medicine. So the first year or two when she'd say something, I'd say, that's not true, that's not real. She'd get mad and blow up and, you know, knock a hole in the wall or something like that. So then by December, December 2019, I think it was, she, um, we were watching TV and she just stopped and said, you're a double agent. And I said, no, I'm not. She says, yes, you are. She said, and I'm going to call the police. She said, you're a double agent. You've stolen my things. And, um, and I'm going to, I'm going to put you in jail. And I was like, oh my goodness, what do I do? She hadn't been taking her medicine. So just to be clear, you, you wrote this to Micah, but now you're saying you didn't do those things. No, I did not slash the tire. I did not, there was no, I don't think there's a naked picture of her anywhere ever anyway I think that was just a made-up thing and I think that her tire just got something ran over from what I understand I don't know I didn't see anything um, but I did hire the PI before I did everything I could to stop her from getting a weapon everything you could imagine I hired a private eye and I said uh, track put a tracker on her car and if she gets anywhere near a gun store <clears throat> please let me know um, I, did, I did everything I could think of <clears throat> and um, did, they, did that private eye alert you she never that oh, day? no I had stopped paying for it about three weeks beforehand four weeks beforehand yeah. Why? Um, running out of money and um, people telling me that she was totally fine and I'm wasting my time. So what do you say to the doubters and critics who say you drove her to suicide? That's the dumbest thing I ever heard. She, she, <laughs> so wait, wait, she wasn't with me. Because listen, with me, she didn't commit suicide. Apart from me for three months and with her family, she did commit suicide. One of the last things she showed me, she showed me a book she's reading called, I Love Jesus But I Want to Die. And I said, why do you want to die? She said, because I can't come home because my family won't let me. That's what I say to them. I'm oh, sorry. You need a minute? Oh, man. Oh, man. What's tripping you up? Just... Being able to tell him. Just being able to talk about everything. It feels like um, that, uh, you know, people don't care to hear uh, the truth. They just, um, they just want to go off of feelings and believe, you know, whoever screams the loudest rather than whoever, you know, has the proof. Do you feel that you did anything that you would change? Do you feel any part responsible? God, that's a great question. <clears throat> Man, that's such a good question. <clears throat> wow, what a good question. Can I have a second to think about it? Sure. Okay. Oh my gosh, that's such a good question. What would I do differently? Oh man. Oh, oh I know what I'd do. I know what I'd do. I know what I'd do. I would not involve her family 
when she's having mental episodes and is uh, schizophrenic and, and you know, is, is off, off, off her meds. I would never have texted them. We've seen you dressed as Spider-Man in videos. Okay, let me in just, her... wait, wait, hold on. I'm not Spider-Man. In your I can either confirm or deny. To me, it says Spider-Man as the, as the person who's texting me. So we've seen you in videos dressed as Spider-Man. We know there's a Spider-Man character in your back, the back of your house somewhere. Um, her family says, wonders if you have um, identity issues uh, and this need to align with superheroes. What's, what's your reaction? What, what, and what's the reason for the Spider-Man? Well, first of all, I can neither confirm nor deny that I've ever put on a Spider-Man costume. But you'll never see me in the same room with Spider-Man, I will say that. And I don't know, people say stuff. Me and Micah would go You're to- not, You not, so you don't get in the Spider-Man costume? Yeah. I mean, you just sent me a picture with yeah, you and so Spider-Man. Me and Micah, we'd go to Comic-Cons every year. We both dress up. Micah dressed up more than I did, actually. There are times I didn't dress up, and she did. We love that kind of stuff. She would do, she was Wonder Woman, she was Spider-Woman, she was um, Mystique, she was, um, she was a lot of different characters. So you're not even going to grant that it's that there's something odd here? No, I'm not. No. I, I, I put on the Spider-Man costume. I go see handicapped children. I'll, I'll go visit kids that, you know, love comic books and that are handicapped, and I'll um, pretend like I'm Spider-Man, and I'll take them a comic book and um, do videos with them and stuff like that. One of the videos that has surfaced recently is from years ago and I'm sure you know what it is it's you're sitting face down on the ground and you're freaking out <laughs> and you're you're talking about literally squealing about eat, being eaten by ants um <clears throat> taking the wrong meds that you missed your family is your medication something they gave you? I mean, for viewers, for people watching it, the, the, the common thought is, what is going on here, and do you have a drug problem? <laughs> so, so um, I fell out of a tree, a giant magnolia tree. I was like 300 years old. I broke 12 bones. It was 10, 10 to 12 bones. I don't know if you count the finger. Yeah, it was count finger. Anyway, I have all this metal in my body, and um, I'd never taken pain meds in my life, and I just had my body cast taken off. Um, and so I took a little bit too much pain meds that day. That's it? That's Just it. what? That's Percocet? Not, I don't remember any of them. It was 2017, 16? 16. 2016. 2016. And um, it was like 10 years ago, 8 years ago, whatever. And um, and I was missing my family. My, my wife, my, Micah, and I, we started through an affair. And so we were both married to people. And then we, you know, we got divorced. And I was missing my, my family because I'd lost my you know, family at the time, and um, and I was on pain meds, and it just all just <laughs> went together. I fell out of a tree, broke a bunch of bones, took too many pain meds. That was that story. Not hallucinogenics. Not what is what would hallucinogenic be? Make you hallucinate. Well, what makes you hallucinate? Drugs. Like illegal drugs? Hallucinogenic drugs, yeah. Oh, I've never done a legal drug my whole life. Okay. Oh. oh crap! That was a lie. I'm sorry. That was a lie. Um, I, when, when I was 16 years old, one time I was in a truck with two of my friends, and they were both smoking pot. I didn't smoke any, but they do a thing called hot box, and so I got some of that. And I, I tried steroids one time. Be where her remains are found mm -hmm. down the river, and then all the way through this trail, all the way up here, where, is, where her purse and her phone was found. And this water is not moving, it's just stagnant water. It's not moving at all. So presumably, uh, how would her, how would she... There is no logical explanation with the, um... Here, just keep it on the if you could. The theory of suicide does not add up to me because you're telling me her body floated all the way down this stagnant water. And From her belongings were all the way up here. We had to walk down a trail, a separate trail, climb through all this mud and trees and fallen debris to even get to where her body was, down the water. It's not like she could have, you know, left her belongings mm -hmm. and walked down the water and then committed mm -hmm. suicide down here and then somehow the bullets and everything stayed over there. There's, there's no the logical... And the gun was found up here. Mm -hmm. There's no logical explanation for this. 